Joining us now is Talk TV's international editor, Isabel Oakshot. Uh, thanks for joining us, Isabel. Now, uh, I've been uh, bored to tears for many years now listening to Tories say, got to hold on to those red wall votes. They're Brexiteers. We've got to hold on to them. In a stroke yesterday, Rishi Sunak said, I don't care about red wall voters. They can all go to hell. David Cameron is going to lose him the Brexit vote. I believe there is still a majority of Brexiteers in this country. Uh, so, by extension, I think Rishi Sunak just lost himself the next election. Your thoughts? Yeah, I agree with you. I think this was a very big error of judgment on the part of Rishi Sunak to bring back David Cameron. Why? Because quite simply, David Cameron did not fight for Brexit, quite the reverse. He fought for Remain, and that's why he left Downing Street in the first place. He's not a Brexiteer. He never thought it was the right thing for this country. So we now have him as foreign secretary. We've got Jeremy Hunt as chancellor, who is also not a believer in Brexit. And these things take a great uh, set, set the tone, I think, of the party as they go into the next election. Some will argue, I've listened to some Tory MPs this morning, arguing that really it doesn't make any difference. You know, these are just personalities. The policies stay the same. But I don't think that's right. You know, if at the heart of the government, you haven't got people who passionately believe that Britain is best off out of the EU, we are now technically out of it, but we're not doing very much at all to make the most of that opportunity, then I think voters can't have any confidence that any good will be made of the opportunities that we fought so hard to get for ourselves uh, in that referendum. So the other issue, of course, is immigration. David Cameron famously said that he wanted, his ambition was to bring immigration down to the tens of thousands. That was uh, way back in 2010. Uh, you know, not only his administration, but every single one that's come after it has abjectly failed to do anything remotely like that and has, in fact, gone precisely in the opposite direction. So I think this sets really the very wrong tone in terms of appealing to those voters who came over to the Conservative Party under Boris Johnson, wanted him to deliver Brexit, and are now incredibly disillusioned by this government. And by the way, a lot of those voters agreed with pretty much everything Suella Braverman had to say. They've now seen her unceremoniously ousted from government. And that is effectively sticking two fingers up at those voters who shared her views. Yeah, voters, I think David Cameron once called fruitcakes, lunatics and closet racists. Now, his critics would say that he likes nothing more than tooling around, shaking hands internationally and, well, lining his pockets. And others suggest that he's been saying for a long time he'd like to come back as a foreign minister. You wrote the book on David Cameron, the man. Uh, how long do you think this has been in train? Do you think he's been working behind the scenes to get this gig for a while? I don't think that. I mean, I don't have any special knowledge on that. You know, whilst David Cameron lives very near where I live, um, I think if we bumped into each other, which has very occasionally happened, there wouldn't be much um, sharing of confidences, shall we say. Gee, why? Um, <laughs> I think Cameron has been down on his luck. You know, he's not a prime minister, a former prime minister that has really managed to sort of find his way in the world very well since leaving office and we as a country don't massively look after our ex-prime ministers you know one day they've got the full trappings of office and the next day i always remember um hearing about sarah brown gordon brown's wife sort of fall from grace when a few days after they left downing street their car broke down by the motorway and they were just left standing by the motorway waiting for the aa um, this is what happens to our former prime ministers, unlike in America, where once Mr. President, you're always Mr. President. And Cameron has tried to sort of earn a living, you know, make money uh, and has just not really found his niche. Uh, unlike, I think, Boris Johnson, who's really quite happy uh, earning a vast amount of money going around on the dinner party circuit and writing books and speeches and columns. Um Sunak has gambled, has rolled the Cameron dice because he calculates, I think he's listened to these polls and things, he calculates that Britain has changed its mind uh, and it would actually like to rejoin the EU. Uh, that is his gamble. 
uh, and therefore you get a kind of EU fanatic like David Cameron into a position of power, uh, the, the electorate come to you. I think he's made precisely the wrong calculation that instead of lurching left and more towards Europe, uh, the only way for the Tories to have had a chance in hell of winning the next election would have been to have lurched to the right and be more anti-EU than ever. Uh, he's, he's got this wrong, hasn't he? I think that's right. I mean, I would take issue with the characterization of David Cameron as an EU fanatic. He's not really a fanatic about anything. You know, this is a guy that just kind of does a good managerial, a decent enough managerial job. You know, when he left Downing Street for the last time, a camera and an audio picked up him kind of whistling, do, 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 off I go. You know, it's all a bit sort of, well, on the one hand, on the other, it's quite nice to be prime minister, but never mind too much okay. if I'm not. Um, on balance, he decided that we're better off in the EU. That argument didn't wash with the public. And I think you're right that it, I mean, part of the problem now is the people around him. You know, it's not at all helpful to Conservative MPs to see Michael Heseltine popping up in his office somewhere <laughs> in a pumped alarm chair saying, oh, this is marvellous. The grown ups are back. This is the last thing that Tory MPs need, Michael Heseltine on the doorsteps. It doesn't really sell very well. So it's not David Cameron and his pro-EUism, which is um, arguably pretty um, half-hearted. It's the people around him, you know, that establishment elite, which alienates ordinary people who are struggling to make ends meet and do not think that the EU offers any answers to their daily problems, quite the reverse. I mean, one thing that alarms me more than anything is the fact that when it comes to foreign politics, I think David Cameron did the worst job of any prime minister in living history, frankly speaking, uh, talking about a golden age of China. He was the one who basically sold half of our in big infrastructure projects to the Chinese government, sold half of our state assets to the highest foreign bidder when he was prime minister alongside George Osborne. Now he is the foreign secretary. Does that concern you as much as it concerns me? Don't forget Libya as well. You can't forget Libya. Well, there's a, I mean, there's a, there's a long list there. I mean, his um, failure to secure Commons vote for intervention in Syria was absolutely totemic. It was a huge humiliation and actually had really profound implications for the major decisions and the way they're taken on foreign policy by our parliament. It made it, made it very dangerous for any future prime minister to actually take that to the vote. So there was that failure, you know, and this was after uh, Assad, President As Assad of Syria, uh, crossed red lines more than once on the use of chemical weapons, and basically the West did nothing, and David Cameron had botched that. Uh, then there is the, um, the gravitation towards China, which is now completely discredited as a policy. Uh, and then, um, the, uh, as Kevin mentioned, the intervention in Libya, where Cameron thought he would kind of do a blare and, you know, wanted to be ahead of the game on the Arab Spring, wanted to provide global leadership, look like he was sort of bestriding the world stage, making a difference. And as so often has happened in our foreign policy, there was no plan for what happened when they deposed Gaddafi. And the rest has been history and it still uh, has a profound effect on all of us to this day. So I do think his foreign policy has left something to be desired. It was never something he was tremendously interested in um, when he was a younger politician. Um, I'm sure it will suit him very well now uh, to kind of swan around on the world stage again, and he'll enjoy that job a lot. Um, but what kind of foreign policy will it be? Yeah, well, quite. What kind of foreign policy will it be indeed? I, I tremble at the thought. <laughs> Thank you so much, Isabel Oakeshott.